Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. It's time to talk about some of the books that are releasing in May of 2023. Now, I'm going to be honest with y'all. I actually had a hard time coming up with this list today. I do still have quite a few to talk about. However, when I'm typically generating this list, I'm doing a combination of things. I'm looking for books that I personally am excited about and I want to talk about, or I'm looking for things that I think y'all will actually be personally excited about and would be interested in knowing. There were only a handful of books that fit those criteria this time. And a lot of these other books on here are just things that have been getting kind of buzz in the online bookish community at large. You know the drill at this point. I will be going ahead and mentioning the title and the release date of the books and then reading a brief synopsis of them to let you know what they are about because I personally am not well versed on the content of these stories because they have not yet released and I just want to give you enough information so that you can make your own decision about whether or not to add them to your TBR. So without further ado let's go ahead and jump in. We are starting with May 2nd and the first one I have to talk to you about today is actually one that I personally am very excited for and that is Meet Me at the Lake by Carly Fortune. Y'all know that I read Every Summer After earlier this year and I absolutely loved it. It is one of the best books that I've read so far this year. It was a second chance romance. It was an easy five stars, a very emotional and beautiful story. And I am beyond excited to see what more Carly Fortune can do. I don't believe that this book is connected in any way with Every Summer After. I don't believe like this is part of a series of companion novels or anything. So you don't have to read Every Summer After first. This says Fern Brookbanks has wasted far too much of her adult life thinking about Will Baxter. She spent just 24 hours in her early 20s with the aggravatingly attractive idealistic artist, a chance encounter that spiraled into a day long adventure in Toronto. The timing was wrong, but their connection was undeniable. They shared every secret, every dream, and made a pact to meet one year later. Fern showed up. Will didn't. At 32, Fern's life doesn't look at all how she once imagined it would. Instead of living in the city, Fern's back home, running her mother's Muskoka Lakeside Resort, something she vowed never to do. The place is in disarray, her ex-boyfriend's the manager, and Fern doesn't know where to begin. She needs a plan, a lifeline. To her surprise, it comes in the form of Will, who arrived nine years too late with a suitcase in tow and an offer to help on his lips. Will may be the only person who understands what Fern's going through, but how could she possibly trust this expensive suit-wearing Mariah? who seems nothing like the young man she met all those years ago. Will is hiding something and Fern's not sure she wants to know what it is. But 10 years ago, Will Baxter rescued Fern. Can she do the same for him? We have two people who spent a very meaningful 24 hours together and they made a pact to meet up one year later. One showed up, one didn't. So obviously there are very complicated feelings surrounding that, but they are going to connect nine years later and it sounds wonderful. I'm excited to see what will happen. It sounds kind of like a second chance romance, although I don't necessarily think a romance blossomed within those first 24 hours, but I think one is going to blossom in this and I'm I'm here for it. I'm down. I loved Every Summer After. I loved Carly Wharton's writing and I think she's going to do a great job with this one. Also on the second we have The Half Moon by Mary Beth Keene. Mary Beth Keene wrote Ask Again Yes. This is a book that I once had and never read and I ended up unhauling it. I just kind of lost interest in it over time even though I have actually heard really good things about that novel and when reading the synopsis of The Half Moon it actually sounded pretty wonderful. It says Malcolm Gephardt, the handsome and gregarious longtime bartender at The Half Moon, has always dreamed of owning a bar. When his boss is finally ready to retire, Malcolm is in inspired by the place. He sees unquantifiable magic and potential in the half moon and hopes to make it a bigger success, but quickly realizes that his customers don't like change and that making a profit won't be easy. Malcolm's wife Jess is smart, confident, and dedicated to her law career, but after years of trying to have a baby, she's struggling to accept the idea that motherhood may not be in the cards for her. Like Malcolm, she feels her youth beginning to slip away, and while her hopes and expectations fall short of the current reality, she wonders how to reshape her life. Taking place over the course of one tumultuous week, the half moon carefully explores a marriage in crisis, what it takes to make a life with another person, and the true meaning of family. I have said this before, but I really love stories that dive deeply into a marriage because I feel like marriage is probably one of the most complicated and complex relationships that you are going to ever have in your life. Nothing is ever as it seems. You never know what is truly going on with another person. And I like stories that are not afraid to dive deeply into that. And that sounds like what this is. So it sounds like this is going to be extremely character driven, which is of course right at my alley. It sounds like it's going to be beautiful, poignant, possibly a little bit heartbreaking as you are watching this couple struggle with multiple different areas, including infertility and it absolutely sounded really beautiful so I might be willing to give this a try especially if it shows up as another book of the month selection because that's where I got Ask Again Yes the first time so if this one shows up I may be willing to give it a try. Also on the second we have an interesting fantasy coming out from Rebecca Yaros called The Fourth Wing. Now I've heard of Rebecca Yaros before but I think she typically writes contemporary so this may be her debut fantasy novel. It follows 20 year old Violet Sorengale who was supposed to enter the scribe quandary living a life amongst books and history. All right I want to join 
writing this scribe quadrant let me in. Now the commandeering general, also known as her toughest talent mother, has ordered Violet to join the hundreds of candidates striving to become the elite of Navarre, dragon riders. But when you're smaller than everyone else and your body is brittle, death is only a heartbeat away because dragons don't bond to fragile humans, they incinerate them. With fewer dragons willing to bond than cadets, most would kill Violet to get their own chances of success. The rest would kill her just for being her mother's daughter, like Zayden Ryerson, the most powerful and ruthless wing leader in the riders quadrant. She'll need every edge her wits can give her just to see the next sunrise. Yet with every day that passes, the war outside grows more deadly. The kingdom's protective wards are failing and the death toll continues to rise. Even worse, Violet begins to suspect leadership is hiding a terrible secret. Friends, enemies, lovers, everyone at Basquiath War College has an agenda because once you enter, there are only two ways out, graduate or die. So this is definitely young adult, but it sounds absolutely fantastic. And like I said, dragon writers. So if that appeals to you, I wanted to go ahead and mention it. Again, it comes out on the second. Another YA fantasy that comes out on the second is Isle of the Gods by Amy Kaufman. Now, I typically don't include a lot of YA in these recommendations videos just because I personally don't read YA very often anymore unless it's YA fantasy or sci-fi and so some of these ones intrigued me but I really wanted to mention this just because I'm personally a fan of Amy Kaufman as a pairing with Jay Kristoff. I've never read anything by her on her own but I know that she is a very popular YA author and so I wanted to go ahead and mention this here. It looks like this is the first in a start of a new series that's like pirate fantasy. It says when Sally's father leaves her high and dry in the port of Kirkpole she has no intention of writing out the winter on land while he sails to adventure in the North Seas but any plans to follow him are dashed when a handsome stranger with telltale magician's marks on his arms boards her ship, presenting her and the crew with a dangerous mission to cross the Crescent Sea without detection so he can complete a ritual on the sacred Isle of the Gods. What starts as a leisure cruise will lead to acts of treason and the sheer terror on the high seas bringing two countries to the brink of war, two strangers closer than they ever thought possible, and stirring two dangerous gods from the centuries of slumber. Magic, romance, and slumbering gods clash and the start of a riveting fantasy series that spans gangsters' dens, forgotten temples, and the high seas. So make of that what you will, but I did want to mention it here. I do love me some pirate fantasy. This is kind of giving me vibes of Fable by Adrienne Young along with Daughter of the Pirate King by Trisha Levenseller. So it sounds like it could be a good, fun, adventurous time. Another interesting one that is coming out that has been getting a lot of buzz and has been going around is Chang Gang All Stars by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. And I'm so, so sorry if I butchered that name. This sounds like it's supposed to be a commentary on our current prison system in the United States. It's about two top women gladiators fighting for their freedom within a depraved private prison system not so far removed from America's own. Loretta Thurwar and Hamara Hurricane Stacks Stacker are the stars of Chain Gang All Stars, the cornerstone of CAPE or Criminal Action Penal Entertainment, a highly popular, highly controversial profit-raising program in America's increasingly dominant private prison industry. It's the return of the gladiators and prisons are competing for the ultimate prize, their freedom. In CAPE, prisoners level as links and chain gangs competing in death matches for packed arenas with righteous protesters at the gates. Thurwar and Stacks, both teammates and lovers, are the fan favorites. And if all goes well, Thurwar will be free in just a few matches, a fact she carries as heavily as her lethal hammer. As she prepares to leave her fellow links, she considers how she might help preserve their humanity in defiance of these so-called games. But Cape's corporate owners will stop at nothing to protect their status quo and the obstacles they lay in Thurwar's path have devastating consequences. Moving from the links in the field to the protesters to the Cape employees and beyond, Chang Gang All Stars is a kaleidoscopic, excoriating look at the American prison system's unholy alliance of systemic racism, unchecked capitalism, and mass incarceration, and a clear-eyed reckoning with what freedom in this country really means. So I don't know if I'm personally going to add this to my TV are just because books with so much social commentary are very hit or miss for me. But like I said, this has been getting a lot of buzz. A lot of people are thinking that it is going to be a book of the month selection for May. So I wanted to go ahead and mention that here in case you are interested. And the final release that I have coming out on the 7th is No Two Persons by Erica Bauermeister. And this sounds like it's going to be a really sweet story about a book that is published and really affects the lives of nine or 10 individual people. And I love a book exploring the power of books. It says one book, nine readers, 10 changed lives. Alice has always wanted to be a writer. Her talent is innate, but her stories remain safe and detached until a devastating event breaks her heart open and she creates a stunning debut novel. Her words in turn find their way to readers, from a teenager hiding her homelessness to a free diver pushing himself beyond endurance, an artist furious at the world around her, a bookseller in search of love, a widower wrecked by grief. Each one is drawn into Alice's novel. Each one discovers something different that alters their perspective and presents new pathways forward for their lives. Together, their stories reveal how books can affect us in the most beautiful and unexpected of ways and how we are all more closely connected to one another than we might think. So I just thought that sounded beautiful because I find it very fascinating that we all could read the same book and each come out with completely different experiences and opinions about it. And I think that this book is going to explore that. So I'm really interested with this one and I think I may go ahead and add this to my TBR. Then moving on into the ninth, we actually have a debut by one of my favorite actors, Tom Hanks. It's called The Making of Another Motion Picture Masterpiece. And of course I had to add it here. I don't necessarily know if this is something I'm going to read, but it's Tom Hanks. So I had to include it. Part one of the story takes place in 1947. A troubled 
soldier returning from the war meets his talented five-year-old nephew, leaves an indelible impression, and then disappears for 23 years. Cut to 1970. The nephew, now drawing underground comic books in Oakland, California, reconnects with his uncle and remembering the comic book he saw when he was five, draws a new version with his uncle as a World War II fighting hero. Cut to the present day. A commercially successful director discovers the 1970 comic book and decides to turn it into a contemporary superhero movie. Cue the cast. We meet the film's extremely difficult male star, his wonderful leading lady, the eccentric writer-director, the producer, the gopher production assistant, and everyone else on both sides of the camera. Bonus material. Interspersed throughout the three comic books that are featured in the story, all created by Tom Hanks himself, including the comic book that becomes the official tie-in to this novel's major motion picture masterpiece. So that actually sounds really, really sweet, and I think this is going to be an interesting perspective because Tom Hanks has been such a major part of the motion picture industry for several decades at this point. I think he's going to be able to offer such a really great in-depth perspective on being the person in front of the camera and what it's like to work with people behind the camera, and he's going to incorporate that into this book. It is actually 448 pages, so I think that he's also going to have a lot of time to really dive deeply into this because it sounds like it's also going to be very character driven. And I want to read it, but I'm also really nervous because like, what if I hate it? I never read his book Uncommon Type, but this just sounds like really, really sweet. And I'm kind of interested in it. So I may add this to my TBR, but I definitely had to mention it here. Then on the ninth, also have an adult fantasy debut by Claire Legrand. She is a well-known author in the YA sphere. She's written a lot of really popular YA fantasy, and now she is moving into the adult realm, which I'm very excited about. I've actually never read any of her young adult books, but I've heard so many amazing things about her. And now that she is in the adult sphere, I may be more willing to give her a try. The book is called A Crown of Ivy and Glass. It says Lady Gemma Ashbourne seemingly has it all. She's young, gorgeous, and rich. Her family was anointed by the gods, blessed with incredible abilities. But underneath her glittering facade, Gemma is deeply sad. Years ago, her sister Mara was taken to the Middle Mist to guard against treacherous magic. Her mother abandoned the family. Her father and eldest sister, Farron, embroiled in a deadly blood feud with the mysterious Basque family, often forget Gemma exists. Worst of all, Gemma is the only Ashbourne to possess no magic. Instead, her body fights it like a poison. Constantly ill, aching with loneliness, Gemma craves love and yearns to belong. Then she meets the devastatingly handsome Talon de Astier. His family destroyed themselves, seduced by a demon, and Talon, the only survivor, is determined to redeem their honor. Intrigued and enchanted, Gemma proposes a bargain. She'll help Talon navigate high society if he helps her destroy the Basques. According to popular legend, a demon called the Man with the Three-Eyed Crown is behind the family's blood feud, slay the demon, and the feud. But attacks on the Middle Mist are increasing. The plot against the Basques quickly spirals out of control, and something immense and terrifying is awakening in Gemma, drawing her inexorably toward Talon and an all-consuming passion that could destroy her or show her the true strength of her power at last. So again, this is an adult fantasy debut from an author who is already well-published, well-established in the YA sphere. So if you have liked Claire Legrand and this sounds interesting to you, go ahead and check it out on the 9th. Also, I did want to mention on the 9th that Ashley Winstead, newest rom-com, The Boyfriend Candidate, is coming out. Y'all know how I feel about her rom-coms. I attempted to read Fool Me Once a few months ago and DNF'd it at 12% just because I didn't like the direction that I saw it going. It was very political and it was definitely politically heavy-handed about one side over the other and how one side is worse than the other. And I hated that because I don't think that it's helpful at all and I don't think it's right at all. So I DNF'd it and I kind of vowed never to read another Ashley Winstead contemporary, but I know that she is a very popular author and so I had to mention this here. This follows Alexa Stone, a shy school librarian. She wants to be kept out of the spotlight, but when she's dumped for being too meek in bed, the humiliation is a wake-up call. She decides she needs to change, and what better way to kickstart her new, more adventurous life than with her first one-night stand? Enter Logan, the gorgeous, foul-mouthed stranger that she meets in a hotel bar. Logan is audacious and filterless, making him Alexis's opposite, and boy, do opposites attract. Just as she's about to fulfill her hook of wish, the hotel catches fire in a freak lightning storm, and in their rush to escape, Logan is discovered carrying her into the street, where people are waiting with cameras. Cameras Logan promptly and shockingly flees. Alexis is bewildered until breaking news. Pictures of her and Logan escaping the fire are all over the internet, and it turns out that Logan is none other than Logan Arthur, the hotshot politician challenging the Texas governor's seat. These salacious images are poised to sink his career and jeopardize Alexis's job until a solution is proposed to squash the scandal. He and Alexis could pretend to be in a relationship until election day. In two months, what could possibly go wrong? There you have it, a fake dating rom-com from Ashley Winstead. If you really enjoyed Fool Me Once and want to continue with her contemporaries, this one is coming out on the 9th. The final one that I have for the ninth is also another one that has been getting a lot of buzz and this is another one that people think may be a book of the month selection for May and that is The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Bremer. From the day she watched her kindergarten teacher drop dead during a dramatic telling of Peter Rabbit, Clover Brooks has felt a stronger connection with the dying than she has with the living. After the beloved grandfather who raised her dies alone while she is traveling, Clover becomes a death doula in New York City dedicating her life to ushering people peacefully through their end-of-life processes. Clover spends so much time with the dying that she has no life of her own until the final wishes of the feisty old woman send Clover on 
on a trip across the country to uncover a forgotten love story and perhaps her own happy ending. As she finds herself struggling to navigate the uncharted roads of romance and friendship, Clover is forced to examine what she really wants and whether she'll have the courage to go after it. So this just sounds very, very sweet and heartwarming and tender. It sounds like it also might deal with grief in some capacity because she is a death doula. I also think that it takes a tremendous person to be able to do that type of work to be able to spend their life helping the dying. And so this is absolutely one that is on my radar and I think if it is a book of the month selection I may go ahead and grab this one. Again that one comes out on the 9th. All right, and then it looks like we might have an outlier here. This book is said to be published on May 11th. I don't know if this could potentially be a UK publication date, or maybe this is an error, I'm not sure. But this is a new release from Mark Lawrence. It's called The Book That Wouldn't Burn. Mark Lawrence is a very well-known adult fantasy writer, and so this is the newest and the start of a new series. There is just a brief blurb here. It says, a boy has lived his whole life trapped within a vast library, older than empires and larger than cities. A girl has spent hers in a tiny settlement out on the dust where nightmares stalk and no one goes. The world has never even noticed them. That's about to change. Their stories spiral around each other across worlds and time. There is a tale of truth and lies and heart and the blurring of one into another. A journey on which knowledge erodes certainty and on which, though the pen may be mightier than the sword, blood will be spilled and cities burned. So if you have read Mark Lawrence before and have enjoyed him, this is coming out apparently on the 11th. I have never read any of his adult fantasy, but I know his like Red Sister series is very, very popular. So a new one is coming out from him very soon. And then on the 16th, I know a very highly anticipated book is coming out. That is Yellowface by R.F. Kuang. R.F. Kuang wrote the Poppy War series. I read the first book in the Poppy War series and honestly I was less than impressed so I have since unhauled that book and I will not be continuing and I don't think I'm going to be reading R.F. Kuang as an author but I do know that she's very well beloved and so I wanted to go ahead and make sure you were all aware of this newest release. So this actually sounds like it's going to be a contemporary literary fiction aside from a fantasy novel which is what I believe all of her previous books have been. This follows authors June Hayward and Athena Liu who were supposed to be twin rising stars. Same year at Yale, same debut year in publishing. But Athena's a cross-genre literary darling and June didn't even get a paperback release. Nobody wants stories about basic white girls, June thinks. So when June witnesses Athena's death in a freak accident, she acts on impulse. She steals Athena's just-finished masterpiece, an experimental novel about the unsung contributions of Chinese laborers to the British and French war efforts during World War One. So what if June edits Athena's novel and sends it to her agent as her own work? So what if she lets her new publisher rebrand her as Juniper Song, complete with an ambiguously ethnic author photo? Does doesn't this piece of history deserve to be told, whoever the teller? That's what June claims, and the New York Times bestseller list seems to agree. But June can't get away from Athena's shadow, and emerging evidence threatens to bring June's stolen success down around her. As June races to protect her secret, she discovers exactly how far she will go to keep what she thinks she deserves. With its totally immersive first-person voice, Yellowface takes on questions of diversity, racism, and cultural appropriation not only in the publishing industry, but the persistent erasure of Asian American voices and history by Western white society. So again, this is another one that has a lot of social commentary that I'm just like, really not interested in or chuffed to read about. So I am definitely going to be skipping on this one, but I know a lot of people are really looking forward to it. So again, this one comes out on the 16th. And then I really only have one more on the 16th. It's another one that I'm sure is highly anticipated by fans of Christina Lauren. It is called The True Love Experiment. Y'all know that I've recently given up on Christina Lauren as an author. They are still very highly, highly popular, and I understand why they are so popular and why people love them so much. They write really fun contemporary novels with a lot of quirky characters, but I think I just want a little bit more substance and what I read, so they're not necessarily for me, but this sounds super sweet. Felicity Fizzy Chen is lost. Sure, she's got an incredible career as a beloved romance novelist with a slew of bestsellers under her belt, but when she's asked to give a commencement address, it hits her. She hasn't been practicing what she's preached. Fizzy hasn't ever really been in love. Lust? Definitely. But that swoon-worthy, can't-stop-thinking-about-him all-encompassing feeling? Nope, nothing. What happens when the optimism she spent her career encouraging in readers starts to feel like a lie? Connor Prince, documentary filmmaker and single father, loves his work in large part because it allows him to live near his daughter. But when his profit-minded boss orders him to create a reality TV show putting his job on the line, Connor is out of his element. Desperate to find his romantic lead, a chance run in with an exasperated fizzy offers Connor the perfect solution. What if he could show the queen of romance herself, falling head over heels for all the world to see? Fizzy gives him a hard pass unless he agrees to her list of demands. When he says yes and production on the true love experiment begins, Connor wonders if that perfect match will ever be in the cue cards for him too. The true love experiment is the book fans have been waiting for ever since Fizzy's debut in The Soulmate Equation. But when the lights come on 
gone and all eyes are on her, it turns out the happily ever after Fizzy had all but given up on might lie just behind the camera. Okay, so it sounds like this might be a spinoff to The Soulmate Equation, which I have not read. It sounds like this might be a companion novel, so you don't necessarily need to read the first one before you read this one. I'm not sure, but this one is coming out on the 16th for all you Christina Lauren fans. So oddly enough, the vast majority of releases for May are very much literary or contemporary fiction. There were hardly any thriller suspense novels, historical fictions, things of that nature. The only thriller that I could find of really any popularity or interest coming out in May is coming out on the 23rd, and that is The Senator's Wife by Liv Constantine. This is set in DC, and it's definitely more political in nature, hence the title, The Senator's Wife. After a tragic chain of events led to the deaths of their spouses two years ago, DC philanthropist Sloan Chase and Senator Whit Montgomery are finally starting to move on. The horrifying ordeal drew them together, and now they're ready to settle down again with each other. As Sloan returns to the world of the White House dinners and political small talk, this time with her new husband, she's also preparing for an up-and-coming hip replacement, the latest reminder of the lupus diagnosis she's managed since her 20s. With both of their hectic schedules, they decide that hiring a home health aide will give Sloan the support and independence she needs post-surgery, and they find the perfect fit in Athena Karras. Seemingly a godsend, Athena tends to Sloan and even helps her run her charitable foundation. But Sloan slowly begins to deteriorate, a complication Athena explains of Sloan's lupus. As weeks go by, Sloan becomes sicker and her uncertainty quickly turns to paranoia as she begins to suspect the worst. Why is Athena asking her so many probing questions about her foundation, about her past? And could Sloan be imagining the sultry looks between Athena and her new husband? Riveting, fast-paced, and full of unbelievable twists, The Senator's Wife is a psychological thriller that upends the private homes of those who walk the halls of power because when you have it all, you have everything to lose. I definitely hate plot lines that include women trying to steal other people's husbands. Like, that's just something that I'm over reading and I don't necessarily care to read about it. So I don't know if I'm going to be adding this one to my TBR. I haven't read anything by Liv Constantine, so I don't know what she is capable of doing. But if you are a fan of hers or if this sounds intriguing at all to you, it comes out on the 23rd. Another one that comes out on the 23rd that I am actually personally really interested in because it definitely sounds like it deals with grief a lot, but it's also going to be like very heartwarming and uplifting is Someone Else's Bucket List by Amy T. Matthews. My dying wish is for you to finish my bucket list. I refuse to die without knowing this list will be completed, and I refuse to die without knowing my family will be okay. Jodie Boyd is a shy and anxious 20-something, completely unsure what to do with her life. Her older sister Brie is an adventurous, globetrotting, hugely successful Instagram influencer with more than a million followers. She's the most alive person Jodie knows, up until Brie's unfathomable and timely death from leukemia. The boys are devastated, not to mention overwhelmed with medical debt, but Brie thought of everything, and soon Jodie is shocked by a new post on her sister's Instagram feed. The first of many Brie recorded in secret. Post foretells a jaw-dropping challenge for Jodie to complete Brie's very public bucket list, from fly over Antarctica to perform a walk on Cameo in a Broadway musical. If Jodie does it and keeps all Brie's followers, a corporate sponsor will pay off the staggering medical debt. If she gains followers, the boys won't be the only ones to benefit. It's crazy, it's terrifying, it's impossible and moral even to refuse. So despite the whole world watching, Jodie plunges in, never imagining that in depth, her sister will teach her how to love. And the last item on the list, fall in love, just proved to be the easiest. Guys, I was getting goosebumps and tingles and teary reading that synopsis, especially when it mentioned leukemia. I personally have lost somebody from leukemia and oh my gosh, I think that this book is going to emotionally devastate me, but I'm here for it. Like this sounds beautiful and I want to read it so much. All right, and the last one that I have on the 23rd is also another thriller that has been getting a little bit of buzz, but it sounds like kind of one of those thrillers where absolutely nobody is likable. So I don't necessarily know if I want to read about a bunch of unlikable people. It's like supposed to be isolationist as well. Like they're on this island and something happens and you're trying to figure out who did it, but absolutely everybody is terrible and you kind of want them all to die. So I don't know how I feel about that, but let's read on. None of them would claim to be a particularly good person, but who among them is actually capable of murder? Jen Weinstein and Lauren Parker rule the town of Salcombe Fire Island every summer. They hold sway on the beach and the tennis court and are adept at manipulating people to get what they want. Their husband Sam and Jason have summered together on the island since childhood despite lifelong grudges and numerous secrets. Their one single friend Rachel Wolf is looking to meet her match whether he's the tennis pro or someone else's husband. But even with plenty to gossip about this season starts out as quietly as any other until a body is discovered face down off the side of the boardwalk. Stylish, subversive, and darkly comedic this is a story of what's lurking under the surface of picture-perfect lives and a place where everyone has something to hide. So this sounds like you know rich people behaving badly as they do. And it just sounds kind of okay. It doesn't sound like anything remarkable or mind-blowing, but if that is of interest to you, again, coming out on the 23rd. All right, y'all, and then we are moving on into May 30th, and I only have one book for this. It is The Celebrants by Stephen Rowley. I believe that he wrote a book called The Gunkle, which I personally have never read, but I've heard a lot of great things about it. That sounds like it's like a really just sweet, uplifting, heartwarming story, and this sounds like it might be the same. It's been a minute or five years since Jordan Vargas last saw his college friends and 28 years since their graduation when they're 
adult lives officially began. Now Jordan, Jordy, Naomi, Craig, and Marielle find themselves at the brink of a new decade with all the responsibilities of adulthood, yet no closer to having their lives figured out. Though not for lack of trying. Over the years, they've reunited in Big Sur to honor a decades-old pact to throw each other living funerals, celebrations to remind themselves that life is worth living, that their lives mean something to one another, if not to themselves. But this reunion is different. They're not gathered as they were to bolster Marielle as her marriage crumbled, to lift Naomi after her parents died, or to intervene when Craig pleaded guilty to art fraud. This time, Jordan is sitting on a secret that will upend their pact. A deeply honest tribute to the growing pains of selfhood and the people who keep us going, coupled with Stephen Rowley's signature humor and heart. The Celebrants is a moving tale about the false invincibility of youth and the beautiful ways in which friendship helps us celebrate our lives, even amid the deepest challenges of living. Definitely a tale of friendship, possibly a tale of loss and grieving, and also celebrating life and just enjoying who you are and being grateful. And I might give this one a shot. Like I said, I've never read The Gunkle, so I don't really know what this author is capable of, but this just sounds like a story that will put a smile on your face when you meet it. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the releases that I wanted to talk to you about for May. Again, these lists are never meant to be comprehensive. I'm sure that there are plenty that I missed, especially from the YA age range, because I really don't include any of those here. So please feel free to comment down below any new releases in May that you are really looking forward to that I did not mention here. I'm sure that would be helpful to a lot of people. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and a third video to film. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Thank you.